Thank you, David. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, he even sings better without that beard. You know, uh, someone told me earlier what actually happened this morning was the fact that he was shaving, kind of trimming it, and the thing actually slipped and cut a big gash in the beard. And so he decided to just take it all off. The Lord works in mysterious ways. <laughs> and uh, we are glad that you're here this morning. We join with Ben and David and others that uh, want you to know how happy we are that you've come this morning to join us together in worshiping God. Can I ask you a very personal question this morning? What are you wearing? Yeah, I noticed that all of you this morning when you came in were wearing different things. Uh, do you know in life, most of us wear one of these three things every day? Either a halo, horns, or a helmet. Now, you may not believe that, but I believe it. I think it's true, and I think our attitude is reflective of it. And how we live each day. We either wear a halo, we're friendly, we're nice, we're kind. Or we wear a helmet because we're so afraid we're going to be intimidated. Or we wear horns. Horns. Let me ask you a question again. Do you wear a helmet? You know, helmets are really important, aren't they? Someone said, how would you describe a motorcycle rider that does not wear a helmet? The answer to that's very obvious, an organ don donator. It will happen. But people wear helmets, all kinds of helmets. They may wear a helmet when they ride a bike or when they ride a motorcycle or in, in a race car, maybe. We have football helmets that people wear. We have construction helmets that people wear if they're working on the job. And we are what we wear, and we wear what we are in life. Sometimes in marriage you need helmets, don't you? <laughs> Maybe to protect yourself from maybe your mate. But a helmet is to protect from danger. That's why you wear a helmet. Do you know in the book of 1 Samuel 17, verse 38, the Bible says that when David was getting ready to go up against the Philistine giant, Goliath, and Saul armed David with his armor and he put a helmet of brass upon his head, also, he armed him with a coat of mail. David said, I don't need that. But Saul understood a principle. And that is, is that the head is the most crucial part of your body. Because your head controls everything you do. Now, uh, God made us that way. The head or the brain control, and it's very vulnerable if you are in an accident. People die from head injuries. If you have a stroke, you are physically impaired because of what goes on in your head. The head is vulnerable, isn't it? And that's why people wear helmets or should Sometimes you have to wear a hard hat to church to be able to deal with a sermon, don't you? If the sermon's a little too hot, or if it's a little too hard, people don't like it. Sometimes people take off the helmet when they come to church. Perhaps you might better keep it on this morning. You have to protect your head. And you know we all understand that, don't we? Every day when we get dressed and we head out to work, we allow our mind, our head, to control what we do, where we go, to be able to choose to remember the things that we want to remember or forget the things that we really want to dismiss from our mind. 
Our head is so crucial, isn't it? It affects the body. And that's why, not by accident, that Paul in the book of Ephesians 6 and verse 17 says, to take the helmet of salvation. Now I want you to think about all of that armor that Paul mentions here. He says that our feet should be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. He says we are to be girt with truth. He says that we're to carry the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But he is very quick to mention the fact that we are to put on the helmet of salvation. I wonder how many of us wear the helmet of salvation. Do we know why we wear the helmet of salvation? Are you safe? from the onslaught of ridicule and intimidation that might come from those who are not Christians. Put on the helmet of salvation because that's the most vulnerable part of your body. It is important. Because you and I are in a spiritual war. We may not be wearing a physical helmet today, but we are wearing a spiritual one, and we ought to put it on every day. You are not fully dressed. And when I asked you a moment ago, what did you wear to church today? I'm talking about spiritual things. Are you wearing the helmet of salvation? Do you make sure that it's on. We are in a war with Satan, and that's what that whole sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians is all about. Paul makes them aware of the fact that we are fighting Satan, and he says, No man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a good soldier. You know, we sing all those songs like Soldiers of Christ Arise or I Want to Be a Soldier for God. Don't think you can go out into the world without the helmet. That's why you wear it. And you wear it to protect your head. The spiritual part of your body. Oh, if you hurt an arm in an accident, you've got another one. If you break a leg, you've got another one or hurt your foot. But you've only got one head. And isn't it interesting that Christ referred to himself as the head of the body? Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, And God gave him not to be the arm. He didn't give him to be the leg. He didn't give him to be some other small part of the body, but he gave him the ability to be head over the body, which is the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The head of the church. The head of the church is not in Rome. A lot of people think it is. But the head of the church is in heaven. And that's Jesus our Lord, and we wear the helmet to protect our mind, the precious mind that God has given unto us. You can't love God with all of your mind if you have no mind, but you love him. But then let me ask you another question. Do you wear horns? You all know anybody that wears horns? Don't look at your wife. <laughs> You know what I mean. There are people in this world that, hey, they leave off the helmet, but they wear the horns. And they live demonic lives. They are likened unto Satan. And it happens to both genders, folks. And if you you live your life as one who is mad and constantly upset, and Christianity holds nothing for you. I've known a lot of people in my lifetime that had horns. 
and they wear them very proudly. And that's a shame, isn't it? Do you know that in the book of Revelation, chapter 13 and verse 11, the Bible describes the person that wears horns as someone who is demonic. He describes the great beast that is traditionally associated with Satan as follows. Listen to what John says. Then I saw another beast which rose out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. You know, sometimes we see people depict Satan with horns. Now, I don't know, maybe perhaps they went back to this particular passage and they gleaned that as they think of someone that's demonic. The Bible doesn't really picture Satan as someone who wears a red suit and has horns and carrying a pitchfork. But 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful, for your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, Paul says, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. That's the way Satan really appears, isn't it? He doesn't appear to us with those demonic horns that would frighten you or cause you to fear. But he approaches you as something angelic. And many people give in. In the book of Isaiah 14, verse 12 and 15, God's prophet said, How are you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn? How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. Now this is the devil. And above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. And I will sit on the mount of assembly. He says, in the far reaches of the north. And I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. There's no doubt about it. Satan is destined for hell. And all those who go through life wearing horns, ready to avenge, ready to hurt, will be right there with him. You see, the question is not really so much does the devil wear horns, but do you wear them? <laughs> do you wear horns every day? You go around looking for somebody to tie into? Is that what you do? Some people make your life better by walking into it. Others make it better by walking out of it. And some people out there will do all kinds of unscrupulous tactics to get what they want, even if it is wrong, as long as it fits their agenda. We were talking this morning in our Bible class. We have a lot of religious groups that follow the trend instead of following the truth. They're more interested in being trendy than they are being truthful in the eyes of God. And if it means wearing horns, I wear horns. I can be hateful, I can be unkind. If that's the nature that you give in to. But don't do it. That's not the godly nature. Sometimes people go around with that hateful attitude and they're constantly saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know what? They can say they're sorry all day long, but that doesn't mean they're remorseful over what they did because you can say you're sorry and pick your horns up, 
put them back on. That's not the way we're to live our lives. You're ill-dressed if you wear horns. So get rid of your demonic horns and bitterness and hatred and resentment that is so destructive to your life. Paul writes in the book of Ephesians 4, let all bitterness and wrath, he says, and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. You can't have it. You got to get rid of it. To please God. And you know what? The world sees you. You may not have horns on literally, but they see your horns. By the way you talk, by the way you act. Then I ask you another question, last of all. Do you wear a halo? You wear a halo? The halo is a very interesting thing, isn't it? It is. You know, in biblical times, it depicted things that were holy. It depicted things that were upright. It depicted sometimes things that were so unusual. And something that you stood in awe over. There are so few who wear halos today. It's counter to our culture. A halo does not mean that you are perfect, but that you are striving for perfection before God. You know, the Apostle Paul was probably one of the most spiritual people that ever lived. And if Paul could say, I have not attained to where I am reaching... But he said, I press forward for the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, my Lord. And yet over in the book of Job, one of the ways that God describes Job to the man who wore horns, the devil, he says, if you considered my servant Job, like there, there is none like him in all the earth. He is a perfect and an upright man. Did that mean that Job didn't sin? No, not at all. Doesn't mean that. You couldn't read that passage and depict from that that Job would have been without sin. And Job knew it. His friends knew it because they accused him of having the problem, the dilemma that he faced was over some sin that he had committed. We're all imperfect. We are. But we have to be striving for perfection. I'm not perfect. But neither are you. You know, when I think about Jesus and the characteristics of his life, I think about so many qualities that describe one who could truthfully wear a halo. Compassion. Oh, didn't Jesus manifest compassion wherever he was? Everywhere. He had compassion on those that had physical maladies and abnormalities. He had compassion upon those who had lost their loved ones in death. He had compassion upon those who were considered the outcast of his day, as someone said, the disenfranchised. He was a servant. You want to wear a halo? Ask yourself the question, am I ready to be a servant? No one taught more on the subject of love than did our Lord. And he said, hereby shall the world know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Put the halo on. When you go out in the morning, get rid of the horns. And wear the halo. And oh, how Jesus taught forgiveness. He says, you cannot be forgiven, Matthew chapter 6, unless you forgive. 
Forgiveness is such an important quality, isn't it? Just like Jesus, I want to be committed. Committed unto him who loved me and gave his life for me. How committed are you? Can you put the halo on? How about gentle? Jesus said, come unto me, all these that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and gentle or lowly in heart. And you shall find rest to your souls. Gentle Jesus. Can you wear the halo? Patient? Jesus was patient. Did he ever become impatient? Absolutely. When he saw that they were desecrating the temple of God and they were extorting money from those who had come from the regions around Jerusalem and they were buying and selling right there in the temple court, he said, it is written that my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you've done nothing more than make it a den of thieves. Be patient. Let patience have its perfect work, James says. When it comes to patience, can you wear the halo? Or self-control? Temperance? He was. He was temperate in all things, wasn't he? Humble. He taught us what humility is all about, didn't he? When he took that little bitty child, I picture maybe two or three years old, I don't know. We're not really told, but it's the word briefos, which means child. Babies. Placed it in the midst of those who were so arrogantly demanding the right and the left side of Jesus in heaven. And Jesus said, it's not for me to give. But unless you become like this little child, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Can you wear the halo? What about being available? Jesus was always available. He was available out on the Sea of Galilee when a storm had arisen. And he's sleeping, but they wake him up in the middle of the night. And in the middle of the storm, Jesus didn't say, y'all go back to sleep, everything's all right. But he got up and he walked to the front of that boat and he said, peace be still. And the winds and the waves obeyed even the Lamb of God. Available. How available are you when called upon? How available? Can you wear the helmet or the horns? To defend yourself why you don't want to do what you don't want to do? Or do you wear the halo and make yourself available? You know, we sing the hymn, David, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. That's what that song is really all about, isn't it? The halo. Let the beauty of Jesus not be heard in me or from me, but the song says, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. The way I live my life. Am I wearing horns? Or am I wearing a halo? Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. He left us a model, didn't he? At least 1 Peter 2.21 says that. He left us an example that we should follow in his steps in whose lips there was no guile, no deceit, 
no hypocrisy. To wear the halo means that you are bearing the glory of Jesus, the Son of God. Perhaps it could be summed up in the words of Paul in the book of Galatians 2 and verse 20. When he said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said, you know what? You don't see Paul anymore. I don't want you to see me as a persecutor of Christians. I want you to see the halo. I've got rid of my horns. When I yielded to the words of Ananias in Acts 22 and 16, and I went down into the waters of baptism, and I put on Jesus. And I wear a halo now. I'm a child of God. That's why Jesus said, if you have seen me speaking about himself, he said, you've seen the Father. Wouldn't it be wonderful if people could look at us and know that we're Christians? Another little song we used to sing with our young people, it says, they'll know we're Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we're Christians by our love. Oh, we don't bear the image of the earthly, we bear the image of the heavenly who is God. We wear the halo because we have the mind of Jesus. You know, for a while there, young people were wearing the little bracelet that said WWJD. What would Jesus do? Those are not very popular anymore. You know why? Because people are not really so concerned about what would Jesus do. It's more today of... What do I want to do instead of what would Jesus do? But let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, Paul writes, Philippians 2, 5. That being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, and he made of himself no reputation. But he took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And wherefore God hath highly exalted him and hath given him a name. A name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things on earth and even things under the earth. Do you realize that even one day the devil and the demonic spirits of this world will yield to God by confessing that Jesus Christ is and was the Son of God? And then in Galatians 6 and verse 17, Paul in these concluding remarks of this most powerful letter written to the Galatian church, said, From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Whatever I had to go through in life, whatever intimidation, whatever hurt that I had to experience, I bear those marks for Jesus. And you know what? The halo, in reality, is equivalent to the crown, isn't it? And when Paul came to the apex of his life, to that great spiritual plateau, 
He could say without reservation as he writes under Timothy that I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. I've finished the course. And henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, the halo of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me. And not only to me, but to all of them that love his appearing. Colossians 3.10, and I've put on the new man, Paul says, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. That's what we have to do, folks. Horns represent the devil and the evil, the debauchery of this world. But the halo represents the image of Christ. You are marked by one or the other. Have you ever been around someone maybe in your day-to-day -day activities and you really weren't discussing religion? But you just got to talking and you got the feeling that the person that you were talking to was a Christian? That's happened to me many, many times. Oh, there wasn't a big halo that appeared over their head but they were wearing it in their heart. And I knew. I knew what they didn't have to tell me. It was obvious. How obvious is your life to those you meet on the street? Revelation 19 and 20, the Bible says the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. What do you wear? What's your daily attire? Horns? Helmets? Or halos? The Bible says that we're to adorn. That word adorn means to put it on. You put on the doctrine of Christ, Titus 2 and verse 10. But you know what? You can't put on the helmet of salvation until you put on Christ. You can. People know. That's why the Bible says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's the way you put him on. And then you start living in such a way as to identify with the things that are high and holy and precious and spiritual and meaningful in your life daily. Paul said one time, I die daily. You know why? Almost every morning you have to get out of bed and crucify self, don't you? You have to keep getting rid of that old man. He keeps wanting to resurrect. <laughs> we have to keep him buried that the Jesus who came and gave his life for us might shine through. This morning we give you an opportunity to put on Jesus in baptism. To come and make the confession of faith that you believe that he's the son of God. And to desire to repent of your sins, and to be buried with Christ in baptism, to put on Jesus. That's how you do it. And then you have to get rid of the horns, folks. You have to leave the horns in the grave to come forth as a new creature in Christ. And we invite you to do that this morning as we stand and as we sing.